please welcome Charles Bernstein. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here and great to be in this area. I came uh, to this part of England to visit uh, Maggie o O'Sullivan at Hebden Bridge. So with uh, Susan, and we've had a wonderful uh, few days. Um, I've always seen her in London, and she said she'll come up and see where I live. And so that's been absolutely a great experience for me. Um, and I'm not going to read from this book, uh, Pitch of Poetry, uh, but I'll just read the last uh, couple of paragraphs of my essay on Maggie O'Sullivan. There is no rhythm without song, and yet song codes the acoustic, and yet song codes the acoustic surfite that is O'Sullivan's core. Iridesce, O'Sullivan's visceral vernacular, carnal thickness, autochthonous verse, tilling the inter-indigenous brainscape of the Celtic, Northumbrian, Welsh, Gaelic, Scots, Irish, Anglo-Saxon, transloco, voco, titillated, strabismus. <laughs> it's not that O'Sullivan writes directly in any one of the languages of these isles, but that they form a foundational force field out of which her own distinctive language emerges as figure set against its grounding. Native to the soiled, apparent, airmost ab originality, at this point they merge and are. Dialogic extravagance in the articulated dithrombotic honeycomb pluriversity quote, to begin a journey, enunciate. You say utterance, I say wigs in, undulating, wanton specificity, utter defiance at language particle pattern recognition system, defiance as deference to the utterly present, actual, indigestible, sputtering imagination of the real as punctuated rivulets of fragrant nothings in the dark dawn, stark spawn of necessities encroaching tears. The medley consciousness of these sounds, these languages, is made palpable in O'Sullivan's poems, which, lends them, which lend themselves to recitation while resisting thematization. Her words spend themselves in performance. Her words spend themselves in performance, turn to gesture as sounds wound silhouettes and rhythms imbibe, re-aspirate incarnation. O'Sullivan cleaves to charm, striating song with the visceral magic of shorn insistence. So uh, we were up in Heptonstall, near where Maggie lives, uh, to visit the grave of Sylvia Plath. Odd to realize that she was buried here. It seemed very <laughs> dislocating to my sense of, of her. But, uh, and then we also saw that wonderful uh, Asa Benvenista uh, inscription on grave. But Maggie remembered this uh, poem I had written on uh, on a Sylvia Plath poem, Mad Girls Love Song, so I'm going to read that poem. Sad Boys, Sad Boy. I ruin my hats and all the mat slides glad. I hop my girls and all is skip again. I jump, I run you up inside my truck. The car goes looping out in dark and light and yellow hat slides in. I run my mats and all the girls slides glad. I hoped you skip me into luck, 
and chomp me black, ruin me glad. I jump, I run you up inside my truck. I jump my slopes and all the dope slide glad. I glide my luck and all is slip again. I jump my hopes and all the rope glide sad. I skip you jump the way you said, but I run old and sigh your name. I ruin my mats and all the girl slides glad. At least when luck hopes it skips back again, I ruin my mats and all the girl slide glad. I jump, I run you up inside my truck. Just read one other short poem from this book, uh, which is called Sapphics. Here where I found you, here will I lose you. Tears on the slow take, tears on the upswing. Hidden when I go now, crushed by a token. Sorrow as a cancer, reason eschews answer. Mobbed by a gay light, scarred in a queer fright. Little did I know then, nothing do I ken now. Fate is a torn wing. Hope is a hypocrite. Um, th this poem is a, uh, another version of a poem of mine called Thank You for Saying Thank You, uh, which um, was in Growing Down and all of us can have it. Thank you for saying thank you was, uh, uh, begins, this is a completely intelligible poem. Each word in this poem is clear and to the point. A thousand readers would each read the poem in an identical manner, and, and so on. So I, I wrote, in a number of years later, this response to that poem, which is called, Thank you for saying you're welcome. <laughs> and it has a epigraph from Rambeau, in bateau frail comme un papillon de May. And this poem was actually published uh, here in uh, Manchester, because it was published in PN Review. This is a totally inaccessible poem. <laughs> Each word, phrase, and line has been designed to puzzle you, its readers, and to test whether you're intellectual enough, well-read, or discerning enough to fully appreciate this poem. This poem has been written for an audience of poets. <laughs> poets who know the difference between the simple past tense and has been, the present perfect tense. And you also recognize the possible aesthetic effect of that difference. Poets who also know that has been has another meaning that using has been has another meaning, even though that other meaning is not relevant to this poem. <laughs> <laughs> this poem is unnecessarily complicated, flailing wildly like an opium addict looking vainly for its pipe at a demonstrably deranged aversion of the necessity in quest of the improbable. Necessity is to this poem what margarine is to marzipan. 
This poem cries out for an audience that is able to savor the use of a single quotation mark, where less sensitive readers would fail to see why double quotes weren't used, and might even be so foolish as to think that using single quotes was a mistake, <laughs> or pretentious. <laughs> this poem has been written not for just any other poets, but for those special ones, capable of appreciating the nuances and tricks, prosody and infrastructures, or their absence in this poem. This poem fancies poetry as an eidetic emanation, so rare and so refined that it will elude even the most elite readers, which almost certainly and will never include you. <laughs> Its attitude toward you as a general reader is that you'd be better off watching BBC News or listening to NPR Human Interest Programming or anyway sticking to the laureates. This poem appeals to a small coterie of those who are in the know by making in-group references that will leave you scratching your head <laughs> if your hand ever frees itself from scratching your ass. This poem is laced, as tea is laced with arsenic, but also as lace is made in Chantilly, with coded winks to beret-clad cognoscenti. Sly references such as the fact that the title of this poem refers to another poem, <laughs> which is never referenced in this poem, or not referenced in a way that the broad public would be hip enough to be hip to. <laughs> Take it. So hey, if you're not hip to that other poem, you will be as out to sea with this poem as the proverbial organ grinder who lost his monkey. Not in the great storm raging, always raging outside, but in the headier storm raging, raging like a god who's lost his sheep. Or a millinery salesman who's lost his samples in the supernal storm raging inside the organ grinder's mind. And speaking of the title of this poem, as we have been doing, we if, but only if, you have, against all good judgment, accepted this poem's insouciant, insouciant solicitation, have you noticed, careful readers, surely Buddha, that the title of this poem seems to bear no relationship to the text that follows. This imparts this poem with an extra shot of aura, at least for those clever enough to appreciate the conceit. By leaving aside whether or not the title is connected to the poem, the title does make an acute social observation that nowadays nobody wants to accept gratitude. They want to bestow it but not receive it. Thank you for writing this poem. No, not at all, I must thank you for reading it. This poem believes that poetry is a higher calling. For this reason, this poem can't be bothered with the emotions and cares tragedies and celebration, torments and elations, worries and ministrations, preferences and aversions, sights and likes of ordinary people like you, the common man, but also common woman and child. Irregardless of whether gay, straight, mixed, or 
can't or won't or would prefer not to be categorized because who cares about such categories except a bunch of bigots and whose business is it anyway? This poem has been forced with leaden heart and downtrodden brow if such an expression of supervening regret does not, though I fear it most assuredly does, lapse into personification, this poem has been forced against its every aesthetic hope to turn its back on you, the reader, who is, come on, let's stop kidding ourselves, a Philistine. <laughs> Stupid, ignorant and vulgar, possessing a limited vocabulary, if possessing any vocabulary at all, and not simply cruising it. A reader who, mon dieu, doesn't even know French. <laughs> this poem's love is not the Costco kind, supersized and discounted. It's a tough love that doesn't coddle or treat you like an idiot, even if thou art one or aspire to be. Aesthetic stupidity is not born, but made. A poem is a place to think, not say, as in a game of mouse and cat where said and read are both the mouth, keeping the cat at bay. Dearest, most beloved reader, for despite the impression I have hitherto conveyed, know that you are always and will always be foremost in my heart. Beware the dark mysteries of this poem. For if even for a moment you lose your vigilant disappropriation and let the poem's insidious charms grab hold of you by your bootstraps and shake you to an inch of your life, even then its black magic will fuck with your head and commandeer your soul. Stay calm, keep your distance, and be sure neither to cry or laugh, because when you do, poetry's boogeyman will have you trapped in her lair. And there's no known escape from that, nor unknown either. <laughs> this poem possesses a nearly absolute knowledge, a virtually supreme truth that it discloses only to a blessed few. This, poem, this poem's address is to eternity and to those in the now and here and the hidden places in between who choose of their own accord out of desire, vision, and with a leap of faith bordering on apostasy to countenance and revere it. It's unreal. This is a poem I translated from Cruz y Susu, who's an Afro-Brazilian poet, it's written about 1898, sometimes called the Brazilian Baudelaire. It's called Sacred Hate. Oh, my hate, so majestic, saintly, pure, and angelic, bless my excess with a fat caress, make me bow and make me proud. Humped by humble squires, proud to be living sans desire, sans goodness, sans faith, sans sons, caressing grace. Oh, my hate, grandiloquent shield, 
agitate my soul to infinite zeal beyond other harms concealed. Hate when hate resounds, arm against a vile amour that defrauds all. Seven deadly sins of my ardor. I think I'll do another translation. This one from Checo Angiolari, who's a Sienese poet from, oh, this is probably written around 1300. Sifasi. If I were fire, the world would burn. If I were wind, there'd be tempests at every turn. If I were water, watch earth drown. If I were God, I'd smash it all to worms. If I were Pope, to hell with moral compass, the Christians would all be flung into a stinking Rumpus, if I were emperor, what did you see? Everybody's head rolling round me. If I were death, I'd go straight for my father. If I were life, I'd run fast from that bastard. Likewise, don't you know it from mother? If I were Checo like I am and was, I'd, shake, I'd chase young pretty fuzz, crips and hags, I'd leave to you, puss. <laughs> Not my sentiments. <laughs> So this is a somewhat longer poem, and it's called Me and My Pharaoh, facsimile. <laughs> he awoke fully charged. You can bring water to a horse, but you can't make it ride. All poetry is conceptual, but some is more conceptual than others. Ambient difficulty leads to poetic license. Poetry has no purpose, and that is not its purpose. You have to get over being over. April is the cruelest month for poetry, and May is not much better, is it? Why write in poems what you could write as easily as poetry. This poem is a crutch that allows us to think with and through it. Every poem must have 13 distinct frames, devices, motifs, styles, forms, or concepts. Poetry emasculates prose. The body can't live with it, can't live without it. I want to be understood, just not by you. <laughs> Last week's weather is worth a pound of salt, just like the lot of wives or the snowy pillars of Danton. There's not a crowd in the sky Familiarity breeds content. Yesterday's weather is as beyond reach as tomorrow's dreams. The more, the move away from close reading often got drowned in the bathwater, even if we could not find the baby. I wouldn't join a poetic tradition that would recognize me as a member. The wheel needs to be reinvented because we're still stuck. I am for almost new art, gently used forms, 
easier on the pocketbook and on the brain undergarments not accepted. The only true innovation is God's. Others pay cash. This is a lie and that's the truth. Better truth in the shade than a lie in the sun. The taste of Madeline ain't what it used to be. Taint what it used to be. All alone and feeling. Operators are on duty. Call now. As dry as a bubble, as expectant as the dead of the night. Without product placement, poetry as we know it cannot survive. Poetry should not be in the service of art any more than religion, ideology, or morality. Poetry should be in the service of nothing, and not even that. If you can identify someone as Gnostic, they are probably not Gnostic enough <laughs> for my money. I believe in my disbelief, have faith in my reason. The sacred in a poem is nowhere seen and everywhere felt. There's more transgression than ritual, but not enough more. There's more to transgression than ritual, but not enough more. There is more to liturgy than doctrine, once in a blue mm -hmm. Ooh. Mm. I left my purpose in my other pants. You are not the only paddle in the ocean, shadow in the dark, line in the poem, lobster in the trap, pot on the stove, wheel on the truck, letter on the keyboard, scythe in the field, lever on the controls, cloud in the sky, fruit in the tree, rat in the lab. Reality is usually a poor copy of the imitation. The original is an echo of what is yet to be. Time is neither linear nor circular. It is excremental. Beauty is the memory of the loss of time. Memory is the reflection of the loss of beauty. American poetry suffers from its lack of uncreativity. I have no faith in faith or hope for hope, no belief in belief, no doubt of doubt. They say God is in the details. That's because the devil has the rest covered. God is weak and imaginary, a flickering possibility. The dogma of an omniscient and omnipotent God maligns hope and denies the sacred as it turns its back on the world. God has no doctrine, no morality, no responsibility. To sin against God is to use that name to justify any action or prohibition, whether murder or martyrdom. I've got authority. You've got dogma, proclaimeth the Lord. Say one more time, it's true, but I don't believe it. I believe it, but it's not so. My logic is all in the melting pot, Wittgenstein. Better an old horse than a dead horse. Alzheimer's. What's that again? So it turns out I'm not a bull in a china shop, but China in a bull's shop. Sometimes a penis is just a symbol. In their gloom, the Jews go and come, talking of Bergen Belsen. I saw time, but it didn't return my gaze. My heart is like a water bucket, 
that returns from the river seven times full, eighth empty. Zeno and Heraclitus are my father's milk. I think with the poem, not who it, turns a phrase, my stock in trade. Negative capability, sure, but also positive incapacity. I always hear echoes and reverses when I am listening to language. It's the field of my consciousness. When we stop making, manufacturing, imposing sense, then we have a chance to find it. A professional poet throws nothing out except the eggshells and the coffee grounds. I think the idea is to be unoriginal but in as original way as possible. Poets are the Pershings of the imaginary, piercing themselves as they perish in spite of native ground. I wish I was still in my pajamas. The unironized life is not worth living. When people know that joke, three Jews, four opinions. What they don't say is that two of them, the schmucks, have the same opinion, while the third, oozu something to me, and it ain't pretty. Absinthe makes the heart grow foreigner. Throughout this perspective, object refers to the digitalized file. Yesterday is a stone's throw from tomorrow, and each new year a vast canvas of impossibility. Caleb in North Fork, you're on the air. Stand clear of the closing doors. Too much is still not enough. Blameless as a sheep at slaughter am I. Guileless as the toll of tidal tug. There are no absolutes except this. It was a veritable bow across the shot. Sacred means saturated with being. Person Bruca. So does scared. So does scarred. title poem of all the whiskey in heaven. Not for all the whiskey in heaven, not for all the flies in Vermont, not for all the tears in the basement, not for a million trips to Mars, not if you paid me in diamonds, not if you paid me in pearls, not if you gave me your pinky ring. Not if you gave me your curls. Not for all the fire in hell. Not for all the blue in the sky. Not for an empire of my own. Not even for peace of mind. No, never. I'll never stop loving you. Not till my heart beats its last. And even then, in my words and my songs, I will love you all over again. <laughs>